Hey, everybody. This is Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com, and obviously I am not in the Ann Arbor District Library Netcast Studios. I'm in my studio. I'm at home today. I'm taking an episode off from doing the live shows as I get ready for the Small Press Expo in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, September 15th and 16th, SPExpo.com. Hope to see some of you guys there. Uh, so in lieu of doing a live episode, uh, technical director Matt Dubay put together the video that was recorded at the Kids Read Comics Festival July 7th and 8th, 2012 at the Ann Arbor District Library. We did a, a full-on live studio audience episode there that's never been seen before, and we got great guests like Raina Telgemeier, Dave Roman, Rob Stenzinger, Joe Fu, and Sharon Iverson, and even some live audience participation on the show. So that's coming up for another. Uh, the next hour will be that episode, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Mm. I'm pulling up samples. Oh, yeah. mm. Do we have to like talk right into these like we did before? No, no, do no. You don't have to observe quite as tight of a I mic. Wrote 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 and I wrote okay, we're going. Time. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off. Sharon, are you? Oh, you're good. You want me up there? Yeah, if you want to come back. I want to come back. I have to be... Just bug out whenever you need to. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll kick it off, and then we'll get then we'll get into introductions. So this is the way we start the show. I say it's comics are great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, right on the corner of Fifth and William. Uh, Comics.aadl.org. Who here? Uh, this is the first episode in front of a live studio audience. Can I get a round of applause, please, so we yeah. can catch it on the audio? <laughs> See how many people were here. Thousands. <laughs> My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and I want to ask the live audience before I introduce our guests: uh, uh, how many, how many here have were aware that the library was doing a weekly podcast? A few, a few. Oh, cool. Well, then this is this is an outreach moment where we let you guys know that every other Wednesday for the last year now we have been recording and broadcasting a live edition of this. Uh, what I like to call the Dick Cavett Show for cartoonists, where we have guests, uh, local guests come in, and we have Skype guests. So I've had Joe Fu in studio before, Rob and Dave, uh, who will introduce in just a second, that they they usually appear via Skype. And we just have a roundtable discussion about something to do with comic storytelling and creativity, visual storytelling, visual art, and so on. And usually we have a lot of fun. Uh, so now I will introduce the guests as we get into our, uh, let's, let's break into our topic of discussion today. First I want to introduce, and I'll pull up on the screen here, uh, it's Yay Time, let's go, because it is Yay Time, because Yay Time himself, Dave Roman, is here. Dave Roman yes. of YayTime.com, Yay Time on Twitter, Astronaut Academy, uh, Teen Boat, TeenBoatComics.com. Thanks for being here, Dave. <laughs> Um, which camera should I be looking at? I, I'm not sure which camera you should be looking at, actually. I think, I think that's, that's the one over there that's going to be on you. But uh, so, so, Dave, this is your third Kids Read Comics. We should say that. that yeah, I think so. That we're all here for Kids Read Comics 2012. So. Yeah. I've, but how long has this been going on? Four this is our years? fourth year doing Four it. Yes, yeah, so I missed the first one. Well, it's okay. You're here for, all the, for, the, the, for the, little, the most important one, this one, 2012. That's right. But Dave, you hail all the way from... The year we made contact. <laughs> yeah, that is the year we made contact. Uh, but you hail from New York. You're here from Queens, New York. Yes, Astoria, Queens, New York. Oh. Boom. Yes. I didn't know. I thought Queens itself was... I'm Queens, showing my Queens, ignorance of New York. Queens has multiple parts. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, thank you for being here, Dave. We'll talk more in a second. Then I want to introduce Mr. Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com and leanintoart.com. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Jersey. And Rob hails uh, from Minnesota. Yeah, don't you know? <laughs> uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and you've been, you, you just did a panel for us. Well, we'll talk more about what workshops you guys are doing today, too, in a second. But yeah, uh, Rob's got a video game workshop coming. So Rob is a cartoonist and a teaching artist and a game designer, UI designer, UX designer. The man does uh, just about everything. Uh, and then we have of Desmond'sComic.com, Mr. Joe Fu, the man with the megaphone. You're too kind. Joe Fu is a, you are a cartoonist and an art teacher. I am. I uh, am a art instructor at College for Creative Studies in Detroit, locally here in Michigan. Uh, I teach a whole bunch of whiny college <laughs> students. <laughs> 
I, I, I take it you're tenured if you're able to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so if anyone needs an art instructor out there, I'm available. <laughs> and, and I'll complain about you later. No, no, Joe, Joe's a great guy, and he's been a guest on Comics Are Great before, and also uh, he's leading a bunch of workshops for us here at Kids Read Comics this weekend. So then yeah. I have to turn to the Don of the comic scene here in Ann Arbor. She always gets angry at me when I say this, but she is, has been instrumental in developing a lot of the comic scene that's been happening here in the Ann Arbor area. It's Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library, teen librarian of AADL.org. Welcome, Sharon. Woo! Thank you. So I want to start with this episode by talking about, um, you know, we're here for Kids Read Comics 2012, uh, which is being hosted by the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, we took over the whole building this weekend, and I'm wondering if we could start with uh, sharing some of our reactions, experiences, anecdotes from what's happened so far on the first day of the event. Has anything interesting happened to you on the floor of KRC this weekend? And then we will open the floor for questions, too, to talk more about, like, podcasting, comics, comics advocacy, and so on. But I want to start first with the KRC stuff. So anybody want to kick it off, Sharon? Sure. Um, this morning I was in the first computer lab session when it was cooler. Uh, now it's warm. But um, it was Krishna, and I do not know how to say Krishna's... Sadasavam of PCWeenies.com. PCWeenies.com, who did a fantastic workshop on the whole idea that in learning to draw, if you take a flower sack you can make just about any kind, design any kind of character that you can imagine. And there was one point during the session that I watched him drawing um, a character, full, full character face with the flower sack and I saw in the moments in which he was drawing it, I saw Casper the Ghost and then it changed to Tweety Bird before it ended up finally as the character and I went oh my gosh look at you know and he said you know it played into his hand because of course you can with the flower sack shape you can do all this stuff and um, so that was quite fun to watch um, that everybody people didn't have questions they were like they were like drawing like mad with Krishna it was really fun to see that's pretty cool uh, I want to hear from our art educators on the panel about this idea of how you see the world differently once you start because like one of the things you do in art education is you try to find a very simple way a simple metaphor for what we do on paper right mm -hmm. and that's that's Krishna's uh, angle was like if you just think of the torso as a flower sack it's pretty easy to twist that around in your mind and then build the body off of that um, Joe or Rob I'm wondering if either of you guys can report to this idea of like one once you learn a simple approach like that does it change the way you see the world like are you seeing flower sacks everywhere uh, well I'll, I'll tell you this here's my highlight of krc 2012 uh, thinking of a new workshop to do tomorrow because krishna stole mine <laughs> because that is totally what i teach uh anytime in animation you do want that torso to be a flower sack and or i i I call it uh, like a, a feather pillow to make it a little more <laughs> something that people under or kids understand because every kids love feather pillows. You mean flower sacks aren't ubiquitous in our society anymore? <laughs> kids, do you <laughs> hang around with a lot of flower sacks? Out there? It, it's sort of like a if you think of a rotary telephone, that's a great metaphor uh, for drawing yes. the human figure. No. Yes, or a Sony Walkman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, as an art instructor, one of the hardest things to convince the student is that um, everything's a, a really simple shape and uh, you don't start out with detail you don't start out with uh, trying to put every line in an eyeball and on your first draw and your first initial drawing that there's a gesture involved and a simplification that's involved and you build on top of that and if you simplify first and if you use that flower sack or rotary phone or whatever um, you will, you will hold life. Uh, your figures, your characters, everything will be more lifelike, more exciting, more animated. Um, and uh, you're, uh, once you start adding details on, you start making them a little too stiff. You start. We actually talked about this when when I was a guest on on the show, or you had that terrible Todd McFarland impression. 
<laughs> you did. Oh, thanks, thanks for bringing that part up. That's the thing I want people to walk away with after listening to that episode. It's my bad McFarlane impersonation. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll hear it before the end. Of the, <laughs> no, that's before not, the end. I'm not going to bite that bait. Uh, we're going to hear it. Uh, but yeah, that's where we can go back to the archives. If you go to comicsagreat.com and search for Joe Food, and I believe it was also the greatest comics are great show ever. It might have been. That's what I heard. I can look it up right now <laughs> while we talk about this. But uh, but yeah, okay. So that that also models what we do on the show all the time is we pitch. A question. Somebody answers the question, then we follow up on the question and discuss it as a group. And then uh, we so, make fun of Jersey. <laughs> and and sometimes people give me a really hard time uh, because I take it with a smile. I think that's why I make it too easy. Uh, anybody else have any uh, reactions, th- uh, responses, or anecdotes from Kids Read Comics 2012 so far? Well, let's see. Uh, in general, um, well, no, I, actually, specifically, I I was um, I had the honor of. Um, helping moderate the uh, Making Video Games panel, which was actually in this room roughly an hour ago. And uh, there was a, a question about, um, well, what about the working in the game industry was surprising to you? So not to get meta, but like, so interesting and surprising to me about today was um, just then seeing the, you know, some back and forth between the, the audience and the artists themselves as they were talking through what was surprising to them in in uh, uh, making video games compared to what they expected when they started, um, because I think uh, that is a. I'm back, uh, you know, from coming last year, and one of the things that uh, I really enjoyed is seeing that exchange happen, where you have people who have been practicing art for a while and and uh, sharing those kinds of you know their observations about that uh, and responding to curiosities from the folks that that uh, come up and ask um, or even look inquisitive um, and anyway that that is so it's somewhat um, continuing that thing that I that as far as why I came back and and also neat to see it because it's just really cool when it pops up the the, the exchange of, of um, practice people getting delighted and surprised when they're reflecting on what they've been doing for a while and the back and forth between people who are like hey I want to do that you know we live in a time where it's never been easier to find out how to do something that you want to do right you go to YouTube you say uh, (laughs) my sink broke a while back and I was tweeting about being covered in water and uh, tucked underneath of my my kitchen sink and crying and screaming Uh, and so I went to YouTube and how do you fix a sink and there's a video that walks you through it anything you want to know you have access to this information but uh, that doesn't fix the spontaneity of personal interaction right and having somebody come up with even like a wondering that they don't even have the question fully formed yet you know I think that's that's another really important part of this thing that bringing people into a physical locality like the same I mean, in, in the case you're talking about the video game uh, panel we had Skype guests but you were there moderating you were there on behalf of the people to, to bring that spontaneity to it right and that, that causes discovery of uh, you know uh, really what, what they call in education Sharon back me up on this the teachable moment mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. that's, that's educators yeah. love to use that term um, so Dave anything that you wanted to you're smiling yeah. <laughs> um, well the thing I was most impressed by is that um, John the artist of Vordak the incomprehensible is wearing a full Vordak costume and he's a very tall individual um, so you can sort of see him towering over all the children. Um, <laughs> but also that it's 100 degrees, and he's, like, committed to wearing this, like, really elaborate villain costume. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> that's definitely, um, you know, I want to give him a lot of money. And I can't be doing that for him. Have you guys seen Vordak the Incomprehensible downstairs? Yeah, that, yeah. that's an Which is a really, it's a really great uh, middle grade series, and I did not realize that, he actually dressed up as the character, and that's really awesome. It, it's it's some excellent cosplay. I mean, it's it's a good looking. Yeah, it's costume. beyond beyond uh, cosplay. Um, so, and then just I think my favorite thing about kids read comics in general, and 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 specifically this year as well, is that I love that when I meet these kids, that a lot of them are cartoonists already. Yeah. Um, and this is something you guys have talked about a lot. That you know the line between the people behind the table and on the other side is just you got a table or I don't and and actually a lot of kids who have come to previous shows now have tables and are selling their own comics 
Um, so it's really great to meet kids and then, um, you know, see their work and, and get to be peers uh, with these kids. I, or yeah. envious of these kids. Or, en yeah. Because or, they're or feel so threatened. far ahead of, you know, where we are. You know, they've got, you know, years to just improve and get better and all the technology at their fingertips. And well, you met, you guys met Isabella this morning at the uh, Comics Quickfire event that we, that you led and I just participated in. And uh, the way I describe her is, yeah, I'm going to be working for her someday because, yeah. yeah, this kid is so brilliant. And yeah, with the access to information that she has now, uh, for sure. Uh, so, well, cool. Uh, we were just joined by Raina Telgemeier of GoRaina.com. I think that's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> when we, it looked like Sharon morphed into her. <laughs> she's 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 one of those Odo changelings from yeah. Space Nine. Uh, but Raina, man, what a hero! You just came here from another panel. You were just or another workshop. You just came from your workshop at Eight Two Six Michigan. Um, how did it go? It was great. Um, the workshop was how to turn your life into a comic. And so we talked about taking a moment from your own life, in this case, the most disgusting, horrifying moment from your life, and turning it into a short one-page comic. So we had a lot of really, really gross stories that we shared. It was awesome. What was, can you share one of the grosser ones? Like oh, that's the G-rated? Well, the one that I uh, chose to, what I'll do is I'll, I'll do an example of one person's story so that everybody sees my process. And I chose um, a kid who had tasted Vegemite when he was at camp. And so he wanted to talk about how gross Vegemite was. So that's what we did. Oh, cool. Vegemite is gross. I've never <laughs> tried it, but according to the comic, it's disgusting. And tastes like death. Wow, because see, I've, I've heard it just tastes really yeasty, and and I love yeasty food, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm eager to try it out. Actually, that sounds like a challenge now. Is that a New Zealand thing or is that a Australian, Australian thing? Aust oh, well, don't we have an Australian cartoonist? We do have an Australian cartoonist here. He he assures me that Marmite is quite distinct from Vegemite, so I can I have to go find Marmite. I can find here, but Vegemite's a little harder to come by. Uh, well, cool. Well, thanks for being part of this, Raina. So I, what I want to do, and we've, sh we've shared some stories from the show, I want to open it up. If anybody has any questions that they want to throw at the panel, you can feel free. I, I'm not just going to put you guys in the spot and say, give me a question, because we can keep going. I just want to let you know that now we're entering the part of the show where if you guys have a question, you can raise your hand, and we'll be glad to um, to put you on. Oh, there we go. And you can, you can step up to the mic. Matt's coming. <laughs> Matt Dubay, the technical director of Comics Great, everybody. <laughs> Of the ADL Netcast Studio, he he jumped out to say you can step right up to this mic yes. and you can ask a question of the panel. We've got a lot of expertise. Come to the, the hot seat. Yeah, the, the hot seat. <laughs> or, like they do in those real estate ads, it's like where they put like five realtors together and they're like two hundred and seventy years of experience combined. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know how many years of experience we got combined here, but probably quite a few. So if you guys feel free to step up if you want to. So okay, uh, with that, I will say. Um, talking about uh, comics and advocacy and and doing uh, workshops what else are you guys doing this weekend that you're that you might want to tell people about right now Reno you've got other stuff coming up this weekend <laughs> I'm <That's> freezing <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of what that would be oh um, I've, got, I've got your website up right here because oh, pull up on the screen <laughs> <laughs> how about this everybody okay so you, oh, we're doing a reading tomorrow. That's right. So here at the Ann Arbor District Library, uh, <laughs> the Interactive Graphic Novel Theater. What that's is the that? One. Um, that's something Dave and I have been doing together for quite a while, where we will project a scene from our comic up on a screen. We'll do it panel by panel, and we'll have audience members read the voices of the characters. So um, usually I'll you know, work with one or two kids and have them read voices of <laughs> various characters from my comic. And I'll add sound effects, and it's super fun. Talking so, about it doesn't do it any justice. You kind of just have to see it. Well, I want, I, I'm curious. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about like why you have people actually read them aloud. Um, what, is that, what does that achieve? Comics are a really intimate medium. I think that when the artist is making a comic, it's really all about them sitting by themselves in a room with their paper, and they're telling a story. And then when the reader reads the story, they're also having an intimate experience. So it's sort of a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's kind of hard to share comics with a group the way it is easy to share like a story with a group uh, with no pictures or a movie, which you know you can also project a movie onto a screen and everybody can collectively watch it. But with the comic, it's hard to do that. So we like to bring the comic to the screen. And mm -hmm. because comics are on paper, they don't have any sounds <laughs> or voices, so we like to 
get people involved because interaction is it's just it sort of makes them feel like they're a part of the experience in a whole other way yeah and the fun part is is that if kids have already read the book you're sort of seeing in like a new interpretation of it like maybe they've read you know the scene a million times but now they're seeing someone else bring their sort of perspective to it and I think that that adds like a new excitement to it and gives everybody something like you're all sharing an experience. We were at the American Library Association conference last week and I watched you run through a very quick version of this very workshop uh, for the librarians and you had some librarians do a reading of your work and it was amazing to me how all they had to do was just look at Marion Mellonbelly just look at a picture of her and they understood the character instantly and they were reading it in this very bratty, very defiant voice and mm -hmm. you didn't have to coach them on that. It, 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 so like that spoke to me about how the, the immediacy of comics can be expressed to a group, right? Yeah. By letting them do a live reading like well, that. Well, and as an author, it's it's the biggest thrill that every single time someone brings a little bit something to it and I've had boys do the character and get like really into this like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like an eight-year-old boy doing their like valley girl voice or, you know, their like bratty <laughs> Mean girl, not voice, um, is is fun, you know. Yeah. And, and some girls, you know, are like, oh yeah, you know, I'm gonna get my, you know, I'm getting revenge on, you know, I'm doing an impression of this girl in my class or something. <laughs> <laughs> so we have somebody who stepped up to the to the hot seat. Yay. We have a courageous soul in the room. I think you deserve a round of applause <laughs> before you even ask the question. Uh, so okay, so and. Uh, did you say your name, not your last name, and where you came from? Okay, my name is Jenna Actually, Joe from north of Chicago. And uh, you have a Twitter handle, too. I do. I'm at Mentor Texts. At Mentor Texts on the Twitter. Mm -hmm. So thanks for coming. Sure. Uh, what, what do you got for the panel? Okay, well, I'm a teacher, but I'm also a parent. My son is five years old. And anytime I walk into a comic store, I feel stuck because I'm so <laughs> overwhelmed by everything and what's out there. Um, I've read graphic novels, obviously, and I talk to my students about that. But what would you recommend for someone who's younger and trying to help them find something for themselves. Well, there's a whole line of graphic novels for very early readers called Toon Books. The Toon Book series are published by Art Spiegelman and his wife, Francoise Moulet, and they are designed and vetted to be perfect for beginning readers. So there's one called Benny and Penny, and it's actually a series, and it's about two little mice. I think they're siblings, right? And they're mm -hmm. super cute, and the, the language is very straightforward. Um, it's designed for five-year-olds to read and learn to read with. And yeah, and short. There's actually another company that has started publishing in that almost the exact same format. There was sort of like this bridge between um, easy readers and comic books uh, called Balloon Tunes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're putting out books like even faster than the yeah, tune books. They have are. one called Zoe and Robot. And it's about a girl named Zoe and her robot. And the, the guys with the book is that robots do not know how to pretend. So she has to teach the robot how to pretend. Yeah. Oh, there it is. That sounds fun. <laughs> so Balloon Tune, Zoe and Robot, Let's Pretend. And then the other recommendation that you had was, oh, I lost where it is. Benny and Penny. Benny and Penny. I will look that up right now. Yeah. And there's great websites like School Library Journal has their Great Comics for Kids blog. Um, that They're always reviewing great books. And um, Scott Robbins, who blogs for them, just uh, co-wrote a book called A Parent's Guide to, what, Raina knows the title of it, what's it called? <laughs> I think it's called A Parent's Guide to the Best Kids Comics. Yeah. Okay. Kids with an apostrophe. And I think as Jersey has described it, it's like the Sears catalog of great graphic novels for kids, because they've got full color pictures from all the books, and you can just sort of go through, and then they have like all the categories and age ranges and everything you'd want to know. <gasps> There's Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled him up on Goodreads by accident instead of actually. Yeah. There's his book, A Parent's Guide to the Best Kids Comics, Choosing Titles Your Children Will Love. Yeah, I think that this book is going to like make a lot of people happy because it, it really, um, not only is it a great resource, but it, it's actually a, a really fun book in and of itself because you can actually look through all the pages of the samples and get a taste of the comics rather than hearing somebody just sort of describe it you get to really get a feel for every book and sort of decide is this for me or is this for my kid or there's also a really great series called Owly yeah. which yeah, is Owly. a silent graphic novel but the characters speak in emoticons and things like expression you know they they speak in smiley faces and exclamation points and question marks and it's a great sort of inference tool um, great for people that are just starting to read also. Perfect, thank or you so read. much. Yeah. <laughs>
Joe, did you have anything to add to that? I saw you nodding emphatically. I, I disagree with everything. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. My, uh, my two biggest inspirations as far as um, comics to buy were uh, Jeff Smith, his Bone series, which is um, collected now into like this gigantic graphic novel. Um, <clears throat> and I, th- I know he was somewhat inspired by um, Uncle Scrooge comics and Donald Duck comics. And I, I know uh, Boom Comics reprinted a lot of the older um, Uncle Scrooge stuff and even the, the Don Rosa, who was an artist writer, to take it over and really kind of bring DuckTales into, uh, bring it to a new generation. Um, and uh, uh, those comics, you, you, you're like, Donald Duck, okay, whatever. It's just a silly cartoon duck but like the stories that they wove and those those books were phenomenal in fact they uh they're they're there's a lot of urban legend out there that they've actually inspired the indiana jones movies <laughs> um there are some concepts that uh carl barks came up with that like later like scientists were like hey we could do that <laughs> like there was one uh where donald duck um uh, raised a, a, a sunken ship. I don't know the proper term, but he raised a, a sunken ship by filling it with ping pong balls. And then, like ten years later, they were like, "Hey, let's try that," and it worked. <laughs> and it was just a concept in a in a in a funny book. So um, there's a, just a lot of great adventure stories that where you wouldn't think when in the Disney series and and in Bone is like one of the greatest epic, I think, comics of all time. So those are my two recommendations great thank you yeah. well thank you thank you Jen, oh, Jen we ben. should just say real quick that Rain and I grew up reading comic strips like so like Calvin and Hobbes and Garfield and Peanuts that. and all that stuff you know and what's great about those is that they're really short little strips so kids can sort of read them in pieces and sort of you know build their confidence in reading rather than seeing a whole story that may be intimidating um, and then you know joke every page so, <laughs> so you're not saying that you should give them the, like the, the complete bone collection that gigantic like thousand page thing just drop it in yeah the you may not want to like drop that on like on a five-year-old <laughs> it, <laughs> it's good to kill <laughs> spiders <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, i want to give credit to jen jen uh vincent of Men- mentor text on the twitters so hey. thank you jen thank you thanks jen thank you anybody else want to step up to the hot seat or we can keep going with some of these things um See, it's going to get cold. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a whole bunch of things pulled up that I wanted to bring up. So um, there we go. Uh, so I, I wanted to, you could, we already talked about your guys' workshops. Uh, I want to talk about, Joe, you're doing one tomorrow that Krishna already did. Yeah, stole my idea. Now I'm going to so, do a whole different no, one. No, I'm not. <laughs> Come on, uh, totally I'm just going to expand upon that idea of, of creating characters um, based on simplified shapes. And like I said before, that's where all the life kind of comes into the characters. So um, we're gonna just kind of draw goofy shapes and see what is made, out of, what comes out of those goofy shapes. Like if we make faces. Most of my characters, I I base them roughly on shapes. Like someone will have a, a square head or someone will have an upside down triangle um, or anything like that, a round head. And I try to keep those, those shapes intact as I develop the whole character. Just to give it uh, the character some personality, a little variety. Um, I know there's a couple of sites out there that joke um, about finding, I know Jim Lee's a big one, where they find uh, like all his female characters are exactly the same, only with different hair, and they have the exact same face. So I took that to heart um, and try to give my characters a lot of variety. So uh, we'll be making some fun characters out of uh, crazy faces or out of crazy shapes, making some crazy faces out of crazy shapes, and yeah. And then uh, we're also, I'm also calling people out with my good old megaphone in the middle of Artist Alley, because uh, one thing about Kids Read Comics that's really cool is there are a lot of kids there and they all like comics. And uh, a lot of people come and they want to draw. A lot of kids come and they want to draw. And, oh, uh, can I say one of my favorite moments from this weekend? I, sh- I shared a picture on Instagram about this. 
you and Joshua Buchanan uh-huh. set up an, an impromptu workshop oh, you, uh, at that, oh, at that, that was fast. T- we just did that. Yeah, <laughs> like, you just did that a while ago, ago. And, and, I, and I grabbed a photo of it because there you wow, were. Like yeah. uh, some kids just stopped by and they wanted to draw. Yeah, and so and you're like, okay, let's draw I'm together. Just, uh, I just have a big pad of paper, and uh, if someone walks by and they're like, yeah, I like drawing, I'm like, hey, let's draw something. And I get on the megaphone, I call someone over. Uh, it just so happened Josh was not doing much at the time, so he came over and we drew some. Uh, we actually drew some Scratch Nine cats and uh, Scratch Rob Worley. Rob Worley, cheap plug for Rob Worley. <laughs> I'm working on. I, I did a story for Scratch Nine Nine Lives, by the way. Um, but yeah, we drew some uh, drew some cats and uh, Jesse Hughes kind of got involved in the uh, situation earlier, and we drew what did we draw? I think we drew hearts. Uh, the, there were girls. Uh, we drew some hearts, and uh, yeah, we've been having fun. So throughout the day, for the rest of the day today and through tomorrow, I'm just gonna just stop by my table. If you want to draw something, we'll all I'll find somebody. Maybe Jersey box by. I'll grab him. He's fast though. He doesn't slip. I'm, I'm yeah. slimy from the sweat He's from got, being outside. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're all sweaty <laughs> inside too. <laughs> It, it, for, for those who are listening to this way after the fact, it's what 102 degrees outside today, and yeah, and then plus we crammed 60 artists in a very small space, so it's it's very warm in it the building today. There are skylights in that room. Oh, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, it's nice having the, the natural sunlight in a comic convention. That is awesome. But on the other hand, at, at times <laughs> it reminds me of Mocha 2005 when I went and it was, I was bathed in natural sunlight. But boy, oh boy, was it hot in there! It was so hot. Um, anybody else have any questions, thoughts, wonderings for the panel, Eden? No. Okay. <laughs> she just came to watch. She, she's off the clock. <laughs> off the clock? There's no such okay. thing. For well, she works with uh, Small Press Expo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, okay. Well, we got, we got Caleb at the mic. Caleb is here, uh, an- another blender artist, cartoonist, scientist, and time traveler. I don't know if you previously discussed on any <laughs> panel um, team cul-de-sac and cul-de-sac. The my, um, my current favorite comic strip mm. syndicated daily in newspapers. Yeah. Totally awesome. Drawn yeah. by Richard Thompson. Mm. Yeah. Do you, what about it? Are Team cul-de-sac was the um, Parkinson's. Yes. Well, fundraiser. Richard Thompson was diagnosed with Parkinson's yeah. disease a couple of years ago. And so Team cul-de-sac was put together. It's a yeah. book that all the proceeds are being donated to Parkinson's research. Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Was there a better way to say that, Eden? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. And okay. Richard Thompson's a treasure. He's fantastic. Yeah. T- Cul-de-sac is like definitely the best comic strip running in like newspapers today. Like if you were a Calvin and Hobbes fan and wish that that yeah. pa- were still being syndicated in papers, yeah. Cul-de-sac is kind of the answer to that. Yeah. Um, and this book is really awesome because it's all different artists from across the spectrum of comics and animation doing their tribute to the characters. So you get to see uh, Richard Thompson's characters interpreted by a lot of really great artists, yep, including, including Bill, Bill Watterson. Watterson, who came out of uh, seclusion for <laughs> the past 15 years to do a piece for this auction. Um, and all the art was auctioned off. And now there's the book, so you can all go out and buy the book. Yep. I'm looking for the book on the site. Is that it right there? Uh, yes. Uh, no. A fanzine for sale. Oh, Artists okay. contributing. The, the cover is actually the background of the whole site. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's for those who are listening to the audio after the fact. This is at teamculdesac.blogspot.com. Um, cool. So you can buy the book to support the the project. Well, Caleb, that was awfully good of you to bring that one up into the <laughs> discussion. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is an amazing, amazing comic. Um, anybody else want to come up here? Or I can just pitch it to you, um, to some closing thoughts on on uh, this this podcasting stuff and why we do this. So I wanted to, uh, to do a crass plug for this thing that Dave Roman and I are doing. Uh, if you haven't heard about it yet, it's called the Kids Comics Revolution, where Dave pointed out to me that this comics rate thing that you do is really cool, but you don't focus enough on just stuff for kids. And I said, that's great, but I don't have time to do something like that myself. And Dave said, I'll help you. And so I said, okay, talk to Dave Roman every week. I can deal with that. <laughs> and so we started doing this show uh, where, uh, as a matter of fact, we mentioned earlier, um, 
Oh, now I'm going to have to look up. Scott Robbins. Scott Robbins and the Parents Guide to the Best Kids Comics. Our next episode uh, at the time of this recording is an interview with Scott Robbins talking about this book and this project and uh, recommending comics to people, how to find good comics, how to do what they call reader's advisory, and how to identify um, a comic for a specific audience. So that'll be one to look forward to next. And then we're going to have a Kids Re- or kids Comics Revolution book club where uh, if you want to stop by Dave's table today, you can give him some audio about Zeta the Space Girl that might make it onto the show. We ask uh, kids and adults to give us book talks on their favorite uh, comics for young people. Dave, do you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, with the book club episode specifically, I wanted to create like an audio experience that could sort of be used by teachers and librarians um, in addition to their own book club. So if you're using this book, you know, with your students, um, I wanted to sort of create like an, a downloadable content um, that they could enjoy. And it's going to have not only uh, people discussing the book, but um, Ben Hatke, who is the author of Zeta the Space Girl, is actually doing a little radio play with his daughters uh, <laughs> performing the characters. I don't um, think I heard this No, yet. yeah, I just got the audio yesterday. <laughs> Oh, cool! Um, and it, he's actually in Italy right now on vacation with his family, and he just record, he just sent this. They recorded it over the dinner table, um, so it's going to be you know something really special and different, and you know sort of going back to the old uh, you know radio experience. Yeah, get kids, you know, close your eyes and listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. So we we need somebody to contribute some spacey music. I think yeah. if anybody uh, is a, a musician and wants to any contribute some music. Well, but even more, the room. Than, but even more than that, we do want to get more people. Um, submitting uh, book talks. We actually have two of the contributors here in the audience, Colby and Jen, have both contributed to episodes Ooh. of... Uh, is Colby in here? Yeah, Colby's right behind you. Oh, Mr. Hi. Sharp in the house. <laughs> Mr. Sharp is right behind me the whole time. I should have... Uh, yes. I, I couldn't see the smile shirt on him, but uh, yeah. Okay, oh, cool. Thank you, um, Colby. And that's, you know, like, one, you know, what was great is that he had some of his class uh, do some contributions, and we've had other kids doing book talks, and that's just sort of like hoping to get the idea that you know lots of different voices talking about comics and stuff beyond maybe what people expect to hear um, because I think that one of the best ways to get people excited about reading is to sort of break down the stigma that reading isn't cool and I think that nothing gets people to believe that things are cool than if their friends and family and everybody around them is all talking about this stuff the way that like you know a new movie comes out and everybody talks about a new movie but I want to get people talking about books the way that they talk about that kind of stuff and sort of just have you know voices from all different uh, places from the teachers to the kids to the librarians to the authors to the book retailers if we can all sort of like have this as an ongoing conversation I think it'll sort of help you know bring more people into the comics world what's really nice I want to add to this is like it really is like a an old school interactive thing that's important that we don't lose because we're bombarded with entertainment all the time as an instructor it's like I watch my my students who are in, at a college level who, who just can't stop being entertained and they can't stop and do their own stuff because they're always texting they're always checking out YouTube they're always checking out a website they're always doing something else and I think just to be spoken to is is kind of a lame way to entertain people if you if there's any way you could draw people in and have them interact and have them be a part of that entertainment I think the more successful that entertainment is and the more memorable it is and the more it's going to affect you know, to go on like a grandiose scale is going to affect lives and actually change lives to be a part of something that you enjoy as opposed to just watching and having absolutely no part of it. So the interactivity and going back to the old school interactivity of, of actually reading books and um, kind of formulating your own ideas of, the char- of, the, of how the characters act and how they are and bouncing it off other people who are like oh I th- I think this character is kind of like this instead and you know you could have that just that moment and that's basically all it is is having that moment and it that stuff kind of sticks with you so I think the way that it's just like you're bombarded with stuff that is just there for you to experience as opposed to be a part of and I think it's really important uh, for entertainment in order to move forward um, to be a lot more interactive and be uh, just be a lot more um, leave a lot up to the participant 
mm-hmm. to interpret and enjoy for themselves in their own way. Yeah, it's one of the great things that uh, Bill Watterson, who created Calvin and Hobbes, like was really determined to never have Calvin and Hobbes become a cartoon show because once you have the cartoon version, the animated version, you've sort of locked in who that character is. Like now, people know what Garfield is supposed to sound like. Mm, yeah. And even though over the years, a lot of different kids have done the voice of Charlie Brown and the Peanut characters, we all kind of know what Charlie Brown is supposed to look like, they or always, supposed to sound like. They always cast Linus with a kid with a slight lisp, yeah. right? Always. It's because crazy. that now is like, that's what Linus sounds yeah. like. Mm. But Calvin, we really don't know what yeah. Calvin sounds like. And so for every person who reads that strip they're bringing their own voice of calvin and hobbes yeah. to the table okay i'm i'm going to rope this around to talk a little bit more about interactivity because we have uh interactive-storyteller.com sitting right there in the middle and also justify why you guys should be sitting in that hot seat at the same time mm-hmm. because what we're talking about here is we're talking about interactivity we're talking about getting people excited about something do you have to be um super smart to interact with something? Do you have to be uh, a great public speaker or do you have to have like the most insightful comment of all time in order to interact with something that you love? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm living proof. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, let's see. Um, it's it's uh, with that kind of spirit in mind that I, um, I used to craft uh, this workshop, um, Underwater Tomato Ninja, uh, making games in HTML5. And that's that's about um, just getting immersed. Um, some of the the most interesting learning, just reflecting on my own learning experiences, it's it, uh, some of the things that I've uh, gained the most from is when I was in over my head, and but stayed there a little bit long, a little bit longer than I would have been comfortable to start reacting to, and then maybe getting slightly comfortable and seeing what happens. And uh, maybe that's not the best advice, jump in over your head and struggle, but... Um, well, we should, we should make it clear. I want, I want to use this as an opportunity to plug the Lean Into Art cast that yeah. you and I do together, where one of Rob's credos is, is, is it difficult? Is it probably not a good idea? I'll do it. And sink or swim, I'm gonna learn something about this experience, right? Or about whatever it is I'm trying to challenge myself with, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I did. Um, it's definitely a theme that comes up on the Lean Into Art cast. Yeah. It's, the, uh, um, it's 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 one thing to be told something and be presented it, but it's another to um, find your own experience with it and get some some kind of uh, outcome firsthand, and then you can reflect on that and and uh, that. So, so it's one thing to see someone draw on the screen, but then if you're drawing along with them, or if you're on the same page, literally, like on the same page, um, not just metaphorically, uh, that, that's a lot different than just seeing happy trees get painted as cool as, you know. Yeah, as relaxing as those Bob Ross videos are. Exactly. Um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's something that we do a lot is, um, well, and, uh, Along those lines is, is uh, uh, with the Lean Into Art cast, I mean, we often will have topics and things that, are, um, that we've reflected on and, and we're, we're working through, maybe for five minutes, maybe for five years, but we'll come to the table to talk about it, oftentimes without like a tight agenda, uh, where we just jump in. And so we literally act, react, and learn as we record. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we don't necessarily have an agenda of, we're going to solve this problem by the end of this hour. At the end of this hour, you're gonna have this recipe for doing creative things, right? Uh, it's more about, let's, let's, let's just struggle our way through it and open up that process for other people to listen to and interact with on their own. But, but also this idea, this idea of the, the, the question that I originally posed, where you have to have like a really great contribution in order to, be, uh, to interact with something. You know, it's like, um, one of my favorite stories I love to tell is when I was listening to NPR, and uh, they, they were interviewing some guy who wrote a book about John Locke, and I don't remember the author's name, but uh, he was really, really excited about John Locke. And just listening to this guy talk about it made me kind of go, ah, I, want, I, need, I, want, I need to find out about John Locke now. And even when they wrapped up the interview, they said, thank you for talking about this. And he, he concluded, he closed his interview by saying, thank you, and I love talking about John Locke. You know, not the <laughs> coolest guy that you ever met in your entire life, but he was excited. 
he was really excited and his his enthusiasm was infectious and it got me hooked on this idea of like i american history sounds kind of cool all of a sudden right so i'm wondering if you guys could re respond to that a little bit about this idea that when we talk about the hot seat and everything it's like it's like oh that sounds intimidating but you don't what what's what is interesting about interacting with something with people is sometimes it's not about being the smartest or the coolest, but being the most I excited about something, even if you can't put words to it. Does that make sense? Am I making words into a sentence? I don't know, but that's my whole career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I knew, you know, going into art school, going from being like, oh, I'm the best artist in high school, yay, to going to art school where like suddenly you're one of, you know, 500 amazing artists from all over the world you know you, you you need something to sort of rise to the top you either need to be the most talented or you just need to like really be dedicated or really passionate and I think that people who can bring enthusiasm or passion you know you may not you know go as far as you can go but I think you can survive I think that people you know at the end of the day you just have to care about this stuff you know and, and I think that um, you know, it's, it's not unlike being a good parent, you know, like, it's like that thing where it's like, you know, you don't have to read every book about parenting, you just have to show up, you know, you just have to be there for your kids, and you'll probably end up being a pretty good parent at the end of the day. I think Rob that's nodded like, when you said that. I mean, he's, he's one of the parents on the panel. So the, okay, you, you, that's been corroborated. <laughs> yeah, con consider that corroborated. Yeah, it's showing, yeah, showing up. It's Yeah, it's, it's a, you have no chance to succeed if you aren't there. And and if you're there and you're you're choosing to stay in the mix, you're choosing to get in the hot seat and you know stay there long enough uh, to make a difference. There you did you did it. <laughs> most most of the workshops I lead, kids come expecting to like prove how well they can draw, and I'm like, it's not about drawing. It's not about drawing well. It's not about rendering your characters. It's just about getting an idea down on paper because comics are really more about storytelling and communicating ideas clearly and showing you know. A story unfolding in front of you, then making sure every hair is in the right place on every character's <laughs> head. And um, I do one-hour workshops where we have to make, you know, a short story. And so there's no time for perfection. And I try to, I try to tell myself that when I'm working at home every day too. Like it's not about absolute perfection. It's just about getting your work done and doing the best you can in the time you have. Get it done. We have we have Audra Ferici trying to call for the oh. panel that's coming up. We have a panel coming up in just a moment here. So oh, and someone had the courage to step into oh, the hot why. seat. It's about time, Mr. Mr. Aaron Wolf. Good Hi. to see you here. Uh, it, it, Ann Arbor is small enough that we all just know each other. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Mayberry. <laughs> Much like art, comics, and the industry of comics is the same way. That's true. <laughs> Very true. So so I actually wanted to. Um, I was thinking about formulating a, a question, and I don't have it perfectly formulated, but um, responding a little bit to what you just said about uh, perfectionism and about the point of comics and telling stories. And I really connected very strongly with Scott McCloud's work on uh, in making comics, and specifically his framework for uh, the different artistic personalities that people have. And he talks about the classicist and the animist and the iconoclast and his the four formalist. tribes is that what it's yeah. like the four and tribes and I don't really agree with the tribal element of that but I think <laughs> there's something to each of those as sort of a purpose for art and I'm actually a musician and I'm thinking about how that applies in that case but um, as a teacher and as people running workshops for, for kids I think uh, the question that comes to my mind and this is partly because I don't think I fit as well I tend to be more towards the formalist I like Scott McCloud and I like his stuff compared to just some of the best storytellers although I like that stuff um, and in his perception which I think is a pretty good model the formalist is kind of the opposite of the animist the person who's interested in understanding how the drawing works and why do we why do we perceive shapes and we see emotions in shapes that's weird and that's a totally different mindset from somebody who's saying, I just want to tell this story and it relates to my life. And they're both part of actual life. And so as teachers, the question that I always have is, how do we make sure to address all of those? Because even though the majority of the students might be more towards animists and might connect with this, the storytelling thing, if that's the way the workshop goes, then it can, you know, the students who are in the minority who maybe are oriented towards those other personalities uh, don't get uh, the, as much attention. 
stuff. That's uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That's um, you're the expert. There's no, there's no way. There's no way <laughs> to tell. And being there, um, I teach a very technical uh, way of drawing. It's um, uh, perspective is what I teach in art college, and um, it's I teach the way that Leonardo da Vinci developed, and that's how old school it is. Um, and it's really complicated, and there's it's really exact, and it it you achieve perfect perspective no matter what. And um, the way I, I teach, I'm just a hardcore teacher because I believe in developing as a as an artist all up until you come to me, <laughs> and then I'm gonna I'm gonna teach a perspective. But at the same time, I'm not the perfect teacher for everyone, and I, I tell that to my class right away. And I will be, and if you find any one of my students, Chris Houghton was one downstairs. Um, he will tell you, actually, as Chris Houghton's wife was my, one of my students, not Chris Houghton. Um, but at one point, every student I've ever had absolutely hated me, wanted me dead, like would key my car, would do anything, because I'm just such a, a stickler on getting that uh, perspective correct, because that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. Um, I think I reach about 50% uh, that where I really like they were like oh yeah perspective I got it I understand it I know how important it is I know how important it is to get the environment and get the figures working in the environment to tell a story of the illustration and everything like that and I'll touch about half of my class and I think that's a pretty good ratio because the other half I try and they just they just can't get it and I'm just not the right instructor for them um, they see things more as abstract or they see things more graphic. Um, they're better at colors, so they're better painters as opposed to draftsmen. Um, and I just, I try to reach out to them right away if I see that happening. And I'm just going to say that I'm, I'm not, the, you're in the wrong class and you need to find the other instructor who's going to teach it this way. Or you should go into fine art or you should be you know, going to sculpture or anything like that. Um, so it's really hard um, for any artist because no one really knows until they do it like crazy. And uh, at the same time, you have people like me telling you, no, it's got to be done this way, no, you got to do it this way, no, you got to think about it this way. Or you have other people like trying to expand, actually, more what I try to do is expand them and say, why don't you try it this way and think more three-dimensionally and build up shapes uh, volumetrically and see what happens and people are usually like no thanks <laughs> and they walk away and that's fine if that's not what you want that's I you know don't take my advice which is you know but someone out there would be like oh wow that really you know now I could see space and I could work more toward video games or I could work um, in movies where I have to build three-dimensional sets and stuff like that so um, you know I think everyone has their style and their um, what they're comfortable with and n no one else is going to fit into that into that hole and um, it's just it's just developing as an artist and I think Scott McCloud also gave I think it was the six stages of being an artist where one's like you draw a cool picture you show it to your your mom she loves it you show it to someone else they hate it you stop drawing the next stage is like you show it to someone else they hate it you you draw it again, you try to get better, uh, you read a book, someone says it's good, the next time you hear someone say it's bad, you, you stop doing it. And then the next step is like you go to art school and, and it goes so on and so on. Um, that's just the important, it's the journey, I guess, as an artist that we all have to take. Uh, that you have to put up with bad advice, you gotta be stuck in the bad positions. Um, you gotta figure out what you hate doing in order to find out what you love doing and um it's, as the artist it's all up to you guys um, and you're talking sort of at the advanced level like from mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. or like we're you're really thinking about craft and mm -hmm. identity and all that stuff when you know when teaching like younger kids it's all just kind of like comics right and and you can kind of do sort of like generic comics classes and and sort of see with the way that each kid sort of focuses and you know some kids will sort of be focused on the story and we've done comics workshops where I'm getting a ring I'm sorry um, where 
some kids will tell a very straightforward linear story and then other kids are like having characters break out of the panels and sort of like jump from the beginning of the story climb around to the end of the story and all sorts of like really crazy meta things and you're just like whoa you know like you just brought your own personality to that and it's you know you're sort of seeing what that type of comics they're interested in making um, but I never would have been able to tell that on the surface if I just said oh well all these kids are interested in comics but like you said there's different things that you can sort of bring to it um, but I think most of us don't know that growing up, right? Like you think you kind of, like that's one of the things that art school kind of does is kind of like force you to f like take a class and then be like, oh my God, this class is killing me. Obviously this perspective is not my thing, which that's I me. found out was definitely. Um, <laughs> that's what I do. Um, I will go on record as saying that I cheated my way through the perspective oh, class at School of Visual my, Arts. Breaks my heart. Oh. I'm gonna come for my diploma. I, I, I will <laughs> add one more thing to kind of follow up. Um, when I was uh, going through college, my instructor said one of the worst things to te teach a kid is to draw a stick figure because then they start symbolizing everything. Mm -hmm. And Scott, Mc well, going back to Scott McCloud, he talks about how uh, the, uh, the difference between what's actually there and an icon. And he makes, it, uh, he makes that comparison with an eye, where an eye is really a, an intricate graphic shape. But as you grow up, um, you start seeing just the word eye, and an eye has to look this certain way. It has to look like a football, there's a ball in the middle, there's a pupil, and all eyes look the same. Eyes don't look anything like that. Um, so going back to the stick figure, one of the worst things to do is teach a child how to draw a stick figure because all heads must be perfect circles, bodies are perfectly thin, shoulder lines must kind of fall somewhere halfway between that stick body and their two stick legs, and maybe a stick foot and three fingers that are sticks as well. And now they're not actually going out and seeing, um, observing anymore. They're copying a couple of sticks and putting it down on a piece of paper and letting that kind of carry through. And you know, stick figures are fun, funny for what they are. But at the same time, I think you're you're, you're pulling out all these great uh, graphic shapes and you know, a monster with three feet that has a blob for a head and a duck for an eye or something like that you know that kids come up with that are totally make sense to them um, I think when you have those stories like that that's when the creativity starts coming in and for a lot of people that's when parents are like there's no no one has a duck for an eye what are you drawing stop that here's a stick figure draw that that's how people look and anything that stops creativity when you start making them think of iconic uh, icons as opposed to like looking at something and making it crazy uh, from what they see and, and children see things way differently than like like grown-ups see so why would you inhibit any of that um, crazy observation at all so you know just encourage kids parents out there encourage kids to be as creative and just draw what they see uh, as possible because that's where all once you stop them from thinking that way then all the wonderful stories kind of disappear Aaron you opened up a oh, huge I know. I know I'm sitting here like why is <laughs> this at the beginning I, we should have done this we at the top like six different directions off of oh that. I, I've already got like three I'm, different directions I want to go with it I'm ready to flip the table over <laughs> 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 I'm just going to turn to the Morton Downey Jr. show but yeah no, I, well I don't, I don't I don't I know that this is um, I mean this is the sort of thing somebody could just go and do a dissertation about but um, I think as a, um, as a teacher, I, what I'm really trying to get at is something like uh, that there has to be some sort of middle ground. So some, th obviously there's the, this sort of uh, style thing and there's certain technique that gets taught. But uh, if we go to a total relativist type of thing that says the goal is to be creative and whatever you do is okay, uh, you know, it sort of creates this dichotomy. It's, I think it's a false dichotomy. And what I'm trying to get at and I'm trying to phrase this as a teacher I teach music but it's the same concept um, and it's uh, something about understanding the nature of the way we process things cognitively so you can show a kid that we put certain lines in a certain way and it gives you a certain emotional feel and you know those types of facial expression things are not um, they don't come from a technique they come from the way our brains work and so I think some students are more interested in connecting to the emotion and it's about the story and that's the animus type of thing but some students are just fascinated I this was me fascinated by the fact that my brain does this <laughs> and I'm just wanting to explore that so 
you know, I just try every version of a set of lines or something and see if how you know if it looks happier or not to me, and that's that's fascinating in and of itself, and it doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily the same process as going through and making a story, and I guess I'm talking about sort of how to incorporate that. So you don't yeah. want to learn how to draw the happy cloud. You want to know why that cloud is happy. Yeah, it's so something like that. And, and you're, you're speaking to something where I've gotten into um, situations where I feel like I'm almost defending my classes to the parents, where they'll th- the parents will come in and say, well, what do they have to show for their time today? You know, they don't have a finished comic, but they've got all these scribbles. And I'm going, yes, but <laughs> these scribbles that this kid did over here was his exploration of trying to capture frustration in line. Like, well, is it like this? Or is there another kind of frustration? Is there like, uh, is this like kind of like a below the surface, slowly building frustration? And why? And how do we defend it? And the thing I, the language I use in my classrooms is there's no right or wrong answer, but you got to tell me what you're thinking. You have to defend yourself because I'm going to come at you with six questions about why you did what you did, right? And so you're trying to teach not only celebrate how weird our brains work, but also let's celebrate uh, developing thinking strategies or developing ways of thinking about creativity. And in the interest of time, I have to wrap. You guys got to get back to your tables. <laughs> but thank you, Aaron Wolf, for that. Uh, you want to come on the show sometime? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is where I'm going to say uh, this show records every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library at the AADL Netcast Studio. Uh, it, it is broadcast live at comicsaregreat.tv. It is later collected as an audio and video podcast at comics.aadl.org and at comicsaregreat.com. I want to give a shout out to the terrific people who lended all this great content today to, to, to today's discussion. Dave Roman of yatime.com. <laughs> And Yay Time on Twitter. Yay Time, just Yay Time anything, and he's there. And then uh, Rob Stenzinger of interactive storyteller.com. And Rob Stenzinger on the Twitters. And then Joe Fu of Desmond'sComic.com. Joe Fu22 on Twitter. And then. Desmond'sComic.com. What? She plug. I, I, I know, I just got I it, it second, two times. You just wanted it. Uh, okay. Desmond's you comic. It again. Com. Yes, the very, very, very shrewd. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, definitely not least, Raina Telgemeier of GoRaina.com. Go Raina on Twitter. The author of Smile. Raina, at her events today, she's, at some of the events, she's giving away pre pub copies of her upcoming graphic novel drama, which I have read, folks, and it is, uh, it is a very, very important work that I think uh, more people need to see and be talking about. So uh, you can go visit her table down the artist alley. All these guys are on the third floor of the Ann Arbor District Library. If you've got more questions, more pointed questions that you want to uh, shoot their way, you can reach them down there. Thanks, everybody, for showing up to this thing. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting on Kids Read Comics, and comics are great every other week. Until next time everybody i have been jersey droves of comics are great.com and jersey on twitter okay bye <laughs>